John Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm providing some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literature and cultural studies. In this installment, I'm going to say some things about the social, political, cultural, and economic transitions from the early Middle Ages to the later Middle Ages, the 14th century, the time of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. So just to rehash uh, a little bit of the change in circumstance and social context between the time that Beowulf was written down around 1000 and the time that Chaucer was writing the Canterbury Tales around 1380. Recall that feudalism is a system of economic production based on subsistence agriculture, that's agriculture produced for consumption by the local population. And there's some small craft shop industry, but no large scale industrial production of any kind. And no large scale international trade, no international trade in commodities. Essentially what international trade existed was a kind of a token of gift exchange of luxury items between aristocrats and rulers from different regions. That was important, but nothing like what we would have in the late Middle Ages and the early modern and modern period. By the late 1300s, European societies were undergoing a period of substantial change socially, economically, and even politically to some extent. These changes were occasioned by a convergence of factors, one of which was the residual effect of the Holy Crusade, in which armies led by European aristocrats invaded the Middle East in an effort to reclaim the Holy Land for Christianity. The area of the Middle East comprising Jerusalem, Palestine, and what is the modern state of Israel were at that time under Islamic rule. The Crusades lasted for 200 years and the Christians were never able to recapture the Middle East for Christianity, but the cultural exchange with Islamic culture that resulted from these invasions had a profound effect on European societies. The Europeans discovered a rich, vibrant Islamic culture that had a very highly developed system of mercantile trade all the way across from Western Africa, specifically Timbuktu in what is modern Mali to China. Europeans brought some things back, specifically spices of the kind that were common in India and China, tapestries and fine jewelry. And it began to change the economic situation. Suddenly, those luxury items began to represent a kind of money capital in, the, in their own right, but also uh, they began to evoke a desire for a greater spread of luxury. And knowledges that, that had been lost in Western and Northern Europe were discovered through the Crusades and through this encounter. I mentioned before briefly Arabic mathematics. So if you imagine before that time, before the early 13th century, Europeans are making do with Roman numerals. It's very difficult to multiply or divide. And you can't do algebra. In fact, algebra is discovered along with the Crusades. And some of you who've studied a lot more math than I have, if you reflect upon it, you'll, you'll think of all of these words like algebra, algorithm, that are in effect Arabic words brought into English along with the new mathematics that was discovered. That kind of a discovery would really change all sorts of ways of thinking about nature, reality, uh, about organizing systems, and all sorts of things. Let me elaborate these points briefly. The Crusades required higher levels of capitalization in order to sustain these long-term and long-distance military adventures into the Holy Lands, into the Middle East. Eventually, the need for higher levels of capitalization caused pressure on the capacity of feudal political entities, such as dukedoms, counties, and so on. So this became one factor in the emergence of the modern nation state in succeeding centuries.
Another consequence of the need for higher levels of capitalization was the emergence and development of the modern finance system. With banks first appearing in Italy, in places like Venice, Florence, and Pisa, the political and economic entities of the feudal era were insufficient to fund this kind of military adventure. The Crusades also have a connection to modern technological developments. One of the technologies that was discovered in the encounter with Islamic civilization was the astrolabe. The astrolabe was a navigational instrument that had been developed in ancient Greece, but it was not in use by the medieval Europeans. The astrolabe enabled more adventurous long distance ocean voyages, which again, occasioned higher levels of capitalization. So as is typical in these cases, several factors and conditions that are connected to the Crusades, directly or indirectly, all converged to foster change in the social system of the Middle Ages in the 13th and 14th centuries. Well, with these changes that occurred after the Crusades began to occur, with the introduction of luxury items and the introduction, the beginnings of a banking system, and at the same time, and coincidental with those shifts, shifts in knowledge production and technology, over time, people begin to think of themselves differently. And you can see, if we look back, the, the seeds of modern individualism, the beginnings of a system in which every individual is expected to be, at some point, at least when one reaches adulthood, more or less responsible for oneself and no longer beholden or obligated to one's uh, family, to one's parents. So that begins to happen, and we're going to see that shift now in reading Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, and I'll be emphasizing it in contrast to what I would hope I was able to uh, suggest about the ideological sensibility, um, the uh, framework of understanding of a poem like Beowulf. But at this time then, in, in, by the 14th century, in the 1300s, lots of things are happening fast. And it's a period of great social and economic change and crisis. And one of the things that's most fascinating to me about it, uh, all across Europe, is the, the Black Plague. Black Plague happens partly because there's been an increase in commerce so an increased incidence of merchant ships traveling from the Orient to places in Europe. And it was a horrible disease. Typically, you would see the first sign of it with a sore that wasn't healing or something. And if within a few days or a week, the person would turn black and die. It was scary as could be, just awful. And just between three years in Western Europe, it killed about a third of the population. And over a period of about 40 years, from around 1348 to around uh, 1388, it killed half the population of Western Europe in many places. Now, an interesting thing about that economically is, if half the people die, that, that leaves more resources for the half that live. So kind of ironically, um, it means that it's kind of a, a boost to the economy. There, there's no longer scarcity. The availability, just more food, more space, uh, more clothing, more everything, was really remarkable. So all these things begin to converge in the 14th century, in the 1300s. Economic change, new technological developments, um, the Hundred Years' War, the plague, all these things are coming together to contribute to a shift in power that historians identify as a shift from the power of the aristocracy 
to an emerging merchant class. And along with that, the growth of towns and cities. And one can see succeeding waves of transition in societies for the next several hundred years. And that is a movement from the farm to the city. Increased urbanization. In Holland, a technology was developed, power looms attached to water mills first, and eventually windmills, so that a lot more cloth could be woven in a lot less time and with less labor than having housewives with spindles and hand looms working in their homes to weave little bits of cloth. Suddenly, you could have a power loom attached to a water wheel and produce a lot more cloth. But if you did that, you needed to have more sheep. And if you had more sheep on the land, two things happen. One is you need less labor because it takes less labor to herd a group of sheep than it does to plow up some land and plant some crops in it, barley and turnips and so on, just to feed the people who are living on the land. So, one, so a shift begins to happen where more and more people are forced off of the land into the towns where some of them will begin to work in these mills, at first um, woolen mills and, and later other kinds of mills, and uh, the, there just wasn't as much need for them on the land. This caused a lot of social upheaval, but one result of it was also that it, it coincided with those other dimensions, those other um, uh, effects that I, I have mentioned. Technology, the Crusades, the 100 Years' War, the plague, all of these things begin to work together to change what it means to be human, to change how humans live in a society together. It begins to matter less who your extended, fam who your extended family is. Suddenly, someone who's very, has a very fixed and un unchanging status in a rural community you have to stay where you're born. Now, in the town, such a person might become an apprentice, an appre such a person might become an apprentice, such a person might eventually become a journeyman, a master, such a person might uh, rise in the social status hierarchy, maybe become rich. And that person would never have had that opportunity as a rural peasant. What changes? how you feel, what it changes what it means to be human in that circumstance. And the political power still rests with the aristocracy, but it's called, under, called into question, let's say. The Catholic Church also begins to lose some power in relation to secular society. Now the Catholic Church will continue to contest the political power of the crown and the aristocracy. And the, Catholic Church is imbricated, the Catholic Church hierarchy is imbricated with the secular aristocracy during the period. Bishops are often the brothers of earls or members of the royal family or the arist generally members of the aristocracy. And they operate just like the secular aristocrats. But the church exists as a parallel power structure corresponding to the existing secular power structure. I mention this especially because when we get into the Canterbury Tales, the whole setting for the poem is that these characters in the poem are pilgrims on a journey or a pilgrimage to pay homage to uh, the great saint, St. Thomas Becket, who was murdered in his own cathedral by servants of King Henry II in 1170, in the year 1170. Well, the Canterbury Tales fits into a category called estates satire, a kind of a satire on relationship between the three estates, the three categories of the social order. And one of those are the peasants who do the work, the mass of people, and the other is the clergy 
who have authority because of their access to God, their control of divine authority, and then the nobles who do the fighting and the ruling, the aristocrats, the three estates. The three estates are depicted in this image from a medieval manuscript held in the British Library. On the left is a prior representing the clergy who is praying. In the center, a knight in arms prepared to fight in battles. And on the right, a peasant or a plowman with his shovel to do the work. The Canterbury Tales presents an elaborate critique and complication of this representation of the social order. One that's very funny, very satirical, but a satire that would be quite alien to the epic Beowulf with the culture and poetry of that time. With that, I'll conclude this webcast. But, as always, if you have questions or comments, please don't hesitate to send me an email.